Welcome everyone to this press briefing on avian influenza. My name is Annegret Bogart and I work here at the Science Media Center Germany as an editor for Medicine and Life Science. I have to say I'm very excited about today's briefing because it's a collaboration of the three SMCs, the SMC in Spain, in UK and in Germany. And I'm very happy that we could bring together three top experts on avian influenza, which have an excellent overview about this topic and who will answer your questions today. The media coverage so far has a strong focus on the zoonotic potential of the virus, and for sure, this seems to be the most concerning issue. However, the dimension of this panzootic event is much broader. The virus has now arrived in North and South America, and so far only Antarctica and Australia have been spared. Millions and millions of birds have died, and other species are affected as well, like now the colony of sea lions in Peru, where almost 600 animals were killed by the virus. So what does this also mean for biodiversity? Are there any measures that can be taken to contain further spread? How much does the scientific community already know about this highly pathogenic avian influenza variant and what can be expected and translated from, from previous research on other variants? Those and of course your questions we would like to answer in the following 50 minutes. You can already put your questions in the question and answer tool that you find uh, below. Um, please do not use the chat. My colleague, she will collect the questions and forward them to me. So please type them in in the question and answer tool. Now I would like to introduce the three experts. Here with us today is Ursula Höfler. She is a contract professor at the National Game and Wildlife Research Institute in Spain. Her scientific interest is focused on infectious diseases and wild birds, especially those of importance for conservation and for transmission at the wildlife livestock interface. Being located in Spain, she has a good insight into the outbreak at the Galician farm, mink farm. Um, also with us today is Ian Brown. He is a professor for avian virology, pathobiology, and population science in the UK. His specific research interests include the epidemiology, pathogenicity, transmission, and infection dynamics in relation to the control of influenza in animal hosts, including zoonotic threat. He is also the director of the International Reference Laboratories for Avian Influenza of the World Organization of Animal Health and the Food and Agriculture Organization. He has led the science response for the avian influenza outbreak in 2021-22 and is functioning as an advisor in poultry health. Hello, Mr. Brown. Um, the third expert I'd like to introduce is Martin Baer. He is the head of the Institute for Diagnostic Virology at the Federal Research Institute for Animal Health in Germany. Together with his colleagues, he is responsible for the surveillance and analysis of avian influenza cases in Germany. Furthermore, he is coordinating the Delta Flu Consortium, an EU Horizon 2020 project that aims to improve prevention and control of avian influenza. Welcome all three of you. And thanks for being here. Um, I would like to start with the questions to you, Martin. Um, could you please give us an overview of the current pandemic or the zoonotic event situation? And uh, what is the different or the contrast to former epidemics with avian influenza? So if, if we have to go back a little bit, so uh, this story with H5 uh, high pass viruses started in 1996 when this Goose Guangdong virus uh, developed and was spreading from uh, poultry to wild birds, from wild birds to poultry. And after some years, this virus was able to travel with migratory birds. And then uh, a, a group of these viruses, mainly H5N1, came to Europe and to other countries. And uh, this was the major strains further developing until 2014. Then other clades uh, came in, also reaching North, Northern America. This is then the 2344 uh, clade, first A, and then from 2016 on. And this is uh, the, the clade which is currently doing all this uh, panzootics. This is 2344BH5 viruses, which started mainly with, with, with H5 and 8. And this virus was much more reassorting. Re in the in the sorry for that so i stopped it sorry and this virus was much more uh, reassorting with uh, low pass viruses we saw a, a more a kind of a cloud of 
viruses and it further developed and we think it was further adapting to wild birds. And in the last two years, it's now mainly again, H5N1 is the subtype, which is the same clade related to this H5N8 viruses. And there is much more wild birds infected. Many wild bird infection means many poultry infections, also poultry to poultry infection and some spillover, especially to carnivores. So that is the situation. So the, the, the main thing what changed is the virus seems much better adapted to wild birds. And it's also better adapted to situations like summer in, in Europe or even in Northern Europe or in other parts of the world. So this seasonality is a little bit lost. So from 2021 on, and especially last year, and I look to Ian in UK, for example, and also in Germany on the coastline, we had a lot of birds, wild birds, colony breeding birds dying of this H5N1 viruses, which is still, and I think this is important, not a single type of virus. This is still reassortants, which have the same subtype. And we know it's more than 30 genotypes worldwide now, and uh, also in Europe. And uh, I think the situation is worrying mainly in the wild birds and the poultry, and there is some risk of this spillover infections uh, to the mammals. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Martin, for this first overview. Um, I would like to address an entry question to you, um, Ian. Are there any tools or any measurements that can be taken to contain the spread? Well, first important principle worldwide is to do active monitoring and surveillance. So tracking where is the virus, what populations is it in? So there's a lot we can do in tracking and monitoring in wild birds. But of course, the, the key focus is that poultry wild bird interface. So there are a lot of things we can do in poultry. We can have good detection systems so that we can find disease quickly. If we find disease in a poultry or cat bird flock quickly, then we can take action to eliminate that. Um, depending on where you are in the world, there are different systems that are used because it will depend on the amount of veterinary infrastructure. But the traditional method is to detect infected flocks, kill the birds quickly because it will only spread and kill them in time and make sure that the virus doesn't spread from that farm or setting to another one. Uh, so you do that through a form of what we call movement restrictions. So you effectively lock down the area that's infected. Now, if you do that in an effective way, you can absolutely stop the spread of infection going from one group of cat birds to another. Ultimately, if we can control the disease more effectively in poultry, we reduce the interface between poultry and wild birds. And as Martin has said, this virus is evolving quite happily in wild birds, but you do still occasionally get spillback. So we need to cut that source off because ultimately the virus probably will become more benign or die out in wild bird populations. And then of course the last tool, which is being now increasingly used around the world is vaccination. So there's a lot of interest in vaccination. It has been practiced in some parts of the world now for probably 15 years. Um, other areas such as Europe and the Americas are now considering whether vaccination can be a complementary tool to all of those other measures. Yeah, so I, I think to this vaccination point, I will definitely come back. Um, but first, I also uh, would like to um, raise an entry, entry question to Ursula. Um, there was already uh, mentioned the spillover. Um, now there was a spillover to a mink farm in the Galician region in Spain. Um, so you are very um, close. Um, what is known so far about, uh, or are there is there any uh, is there anything new known about this outbreak? Um, is there known how the minks were actually infected, and is there already evidence how the virus was transmitted between the animals? Um, not really, or not much that has really transcended. Um, um, what's currently underway is um, sequencing of all the viruses that have been detected in wild birds in the same region where the mink farm is located. Um, whole genome sequencing to try and compare the um, sequences um, and uh, the gene structure of the viruses, because there was or there is some evidence from, from what is known until now that Potentially, the, the infection of the mink was um, um, through wild birds and specifically um, gulls, because um, they have 
um, direct access to these farms and they're very often drawn to these farms because um, they are open buildings and um, the food is provided on top of the cages so it's really um, accessible um, for wild animals both mammals um, rodents and and wild birds so um, this is the likely route of infection and, and um, there's some molecular evidence for this because of the similarity of this virus to uh, gal viruses that have been detected early on in the region. Um, uh, but this is being further, further tested, so it's not really absolutely conclusive. And so far, the sequences that are around, um, there's still not enough data. So it, they're working on it, but um, and it's and even if uh, enough sequences are around, it's um, not absolutely sure that we will definitely know if this was the root of infection. But it's definitely the most likely one. And on the other hand, um, both the epidemiology of the outbreak, so um, this the, the first um, way the, the virus was spreading through this farm was like um, blotchy um, um, spot-like outbreaks with um, deaths of a few animals and a few neighboring cages um, in different barns and in different locations in the barn, and then more um, sustained spread through the populations and through different barns. There's also suggest um, mink to mink, direct mink to mink transmission in this outbreak. And this is again supported by um, genomic data, which is the um, mutation of BB2 protein, um, the change of uh, threonine to alanine, um, which increases, um, enhances protease activity in, in, of the viruses in mammalian cells, so facilitates transmission. Um, so these two uh, again, th these two facts are circumstantial evidence. Um, you would really have to prove this um, experimentally, which is something that will take um, much more time. But um, there's also some experimental evidence from studies that are not linked to this outbreak that are actually previous to this outbreak from, from um, researchers in, in China that were already concerned about this that have shown that it's fairly easy for these viruses that mink are very susceptible to um, both avian and human uh, influenza viruses, and then they quite easily adapt to um, spread between individuals. So we don't really have um, hard information for this, um, but a lot of cir circumstantial evidence. How likely is it that the mammal to mammal transmission um, at the mink farm was an isolated event? Um, at this point, it looks like it um, was, uh, at least for this particular virus, an isolated event, and that actually um, mink to mink transmissibility developed de novo in this in this mink farm because of because this was a farm that's about fifty thousand animals, more than fifty thousand. So it's a bit like a situation in a poultry farm where you have poultry um, chicken to chicken transmission, and and um, a lot of mutations arise that finally to give rise to um different viruses um in this population and, and this is probably something that happened in the mink farm so um this particular mutation and this particular change in this virus probably happened there um because this um specific uh, virus has only been detected once before in a polecat so that this this is the only mammal detection um but on the other hand, there are a few other outbreaks like the Caspian seals in, in Russia or the sea lions in Peru that mm, although there's no um, data on this so far, but they suggest that that could also be um, mammal to mammal transmission um, be happening somewhere else. But this could be a completely different um, virus and diff or different um, strain and different mutations. So we don't really know, but there's definitely increasing evidence for um, bird to mammal and mammal to mammal transmission. But these are probably completely isolated events. So maybe this is, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, this is maybe also a question to all three of you. Um, looking at this um, 600 animals or uh, sea lions infected in Peru or the ones in the Caspian Sea, what is your feeling? Is this um, are those single events that those oldest lions infected themselves um, I, um, yeah, individually, or does this looks like there was transmission 
among the sea lions? I can go first, and I'm sure Martin will have a viewpoint. Um, I think we have to be quite careful before we jump to conclusions here. Um, so one thing that's important to understand is there's an awful lot of wild birds infected and sick and dying from this virus. So there's a lot of birds in the environment. Um, we know animals like sea lions and indeed these other mammals that have been detected, they either share habitat and have close contact with these populations or they actually scavenge and predate them. So although there's a lot of sea lions, there's also an awful lot of wild birds dying. There's a lot of brown pelicans dying along that coast. So we can't exclude the possibility that the sea lions are having a feast on the dead seabirds. Um, it's important with a number infected like that, though, that the work is done fast and, and the viruses are recovered from these sea lions and they're compared and the genetics is looked at very carefully. Because if you look at the genetics of the virus, as Ursula explained, if it starts transmitting from one sea line to the other, when you look at the genetic sequences, you can you can work that out rather than they're just acquiring the infection directly from wild birds. So I think before we assume, because there's a lot, we need to actually wait for that analysis to be done. Um, it's really important. And I think sustained mammalian transmission is absolutely not proven for these viruses. Now, normally, the sort of populations that have been reported and getting exposed, you know, grizzly bears, porpoises, otters, foxes, they don't tend to live in large colonial groups. They tend to be more smaller population groups. So we say their contact structure is different. So that doesn't, it's not quite like the same as the mink farm. Um, so we have to be aware of that as well. So we have to be watchful, but absolutely, I think we, we need to be cautious before we assume the virus is transmitting between the sea lions. Maybe to add to the sea lion and, and seal story, because we had a H5 and 8 found in three seals in Germany. So that was one of the earliest events and we could sequence them and there was some adaptation, but we could also show that this was single events because the strains in the three uh, seals were different. So that was most likely a wild bird, infected wild bird, which was uh, uptaken by these animals and then they got infected. Uh, I think the pure number that you have 500 or so, this is something which is concerning. So as, as Ian said, we have to look at the sequences because then there should be adaptation. If there is also a, a different kind of sequences, we would see a completely different situation if that would be uptake uh, all in all cases uptake from uh, dead wild birds. So therefore we have to wait here, uh, but it's something we have to be aware of and we have to follow it very closely because especially the species like mink or sea lions or, or seals, they are highly susceptible. So it's easier for the virus to jump over this hurdle. So it does not mean that they immediately uh, now are able to go further into mammals, because this is very special mammals. Also the minks, uh, uh, if you look at ferrets, this is our main model for, uh, for influenza. So the minks have uh, special specialities, uh, which makes it easier for the virus. And the same is for this in group living uh, sea mammals. So it's, we have to be careful to not draw too many conclusions and wait for the, the data we have, but we need the awareness. And I think it is important, therefore, that all these uh, dead mammals, especially carnivores, are collected, tested, and the viruses have to be sequenced to follow. Is there some of the many genotypes we have, which is easier transmitted? Because that's one of the problems we, we see. And there was a, a question I saw that what is a subtype and what is a genotype, whatever. So the <laughs> subtype is the HA and NA type, but there is six other segments. So the virus can still be different. And it is most likely different uh, between the Peru virus and the one in the minks and the virus we see in some cases in wild birds. So we have to follow this very closely. But um, do we know how the new mut mutations in clay 2344B influence the fitness of the virus? It's so many different viruses, if I can say that, that we try to follow that. But uh, the, the, the virus is faster changing than we can characterize it. 
to be honest, that it's the case and we have to concentrate. And therefore this awareness is so important. We have to collect these cases in the field and then select the ones where the situation, like in the minks, the sea lions or uh, other die-offs where we say, this is the viruses we, we uh, characterize. And there are some of these viruses characterized in ferrets and we still see that this is not the level of, uh, of infection and zoonotic potential as we saw with the original H5N1. I think this is an important message from, from my side. Uh, the, the only question is, is some of the new reassortants then different or not? So this is a continuous follow-up of these strains. Hmm. Do you think it's likely that the virus will spread even further, for instance, to Antarctica or Australia? And what species are particularly susceptible or in danger? Um, yeah, who, who would like to answer this question? Um, maybe. Can I, let, yeah. let Ursula have a go. Okay, Ursula? <laughs> well, I'll have a stab, but probably Ian should complete because um, I'm probably um, not uh, all around. Um, so um, it's very likely um this is this is a period when migratory birds are on the move um many of the birds that um, have been in wintering areas are returning to their breeding grounds there's a lot of mingling at stopover points so there's this um and and that we have cold spells that also um drives birds probably in in europe further south and other regions further north so um there's um likely to be a lot of contact and and um, birds that are susceptible are likely to get um, in, into contact with the virus. So this on one hand, and um, on the other hand, um, with you to susceptible species and risks, we've seen so many surprising things with this virus. Um, we can expect anything and that's the danger for, for at least for me, um, this is this is the real drama with this virus that um, it's been affecting species that um, we haven't seen before affected like um, scaven large scavengers like vultures um, and some very very endangered species and 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 it's been wiping out entire colonies of some species so um, this is really um, we can expect to or we expect to see a huge impact on on biodiversity from from this on some populations. So this is apart from um, the, the obvious risk and, and worry about uh, human affections or mammal to mammal transmission. This is the real serious part of this zoonotic, I think. Yeah, Ian, you wanna add on to this? Well, I think um, to, to emphasize the point Martin made, we've got a virus or a group of viruses now that, that are very promiscuous. They seem to be able to extend the number of, and range of wild bird species they can infect. So this is this really is a relatively new development. So the, the maintenance of this virus in, in Europe um, through the whole year, as Martin said, is a facet of the fact that this virus has been able to jump into other populations of birds that it previously wasn't found in. Um, and that's quite a worrying development. So if I look at what's happening in South America, uh, I've seen reports in things like kelp gulls. Well, we know in Europe and, and North America that gulls seem to have acquired, um, this virus has quite a strong tropism for gulls, which probably it didn't have five years ago. So that's quite worrying because gulls are pretty ubiquitous. They move between populations, uh, they shed the virus. And of course, it, we know it's getting into all sorts of populations. So I think it is really quite a worry that the virus has already reached so far down into South America. And we have to consider that there are definitely risks for some really, for biodiversity in terms of Antarctica. I mean, it, it, it really is a concern to think that it could end up in a place like Antarctica. Australasia has always been an interesting one. The Australians have always looked very hard and always remained free of this virus. And that's always been considered because the sort of wild bird populations that migrate distances into the Australasia are not the sort that necessarily carry this virus. But we have to rethink all of this now because this virus seems to have an ability to infect just about any bird population it comes across. So we have to consider potentially all species of birds could have some level of susceptibility, which of course is, is, is a new dimension. 
maybe to, to add here, this means this new populations, also new continents like uh, South America. This is a new number of birds and all these birds carry low pass viruses. And since this virus is so promiscuous to, to switch segments, this means there is a now uh, a continuous change of this virus. And then you have spillovers. And the question is, is one of this better replicating or not? And it's for sure in the bird selecting an even better one, probably. Mm -hmm. And maybe there is then regional optimized for this bird species viruses. And one of the, of the uh, crucial questions in the future, on the other hand, will be there will be immunity in birds which survive. So what does it mean for the future? Is the virus then driving away from immunity or is it stopping spread a little bit? So there is now many, many questions we never had before because the virus was never before spreading like this. Um, Martin, maybe a, a short uh, question. What is a low pass virus? A low pass virus is a virus which we normally see in mainly waterfowl, but all kinds of birds. And this is, if we talk again about subtypes from H1 to H16 and N1 to N9, so a lot of different viruses which are not so harmful to the birds, and only two types, the H5 and the H7, if they come into chicken or turkey, they can change to this high pass by a mutation in the hemagglutinin, and then they are a deadly virus, especially for uh, chicken, turkey, but also some types of ducks, and this happened many years ago for one H5 type. And this one is a, it's a success story for the virus. So in 1996, it's developing further. And the more it can spread, the better it can optimize. Yeah. Uh, maybe a very short question, but I think it's quite interesting. Have there been historic examples of such a widespread of a zoonotic disease, or is this unprecedented? We have to be clear, this is not currently a zoonosis. There is occasional spillover. Um, and of course, indeed, there have been quite a significant number of human cases since 1996. So as Martin said, that virus emerged in Southeast Asia. And in the early years, there were quite a lot of human infections with quite a high case fatality rate. But the key thing was that virus wasn't able to transmit from one human to another. Now, that still remains the situation, although we have to obviously be very vigilant, that although there's a very large population of birds now around the globe infected with these viruses, we're still seeing that spillover into humans as a very, very rare event. So I think for us to talk about zoonoses, um, we, we, we're not at that point. We have to be mindful that this virus, of course, has uh, got the ability to change. And could it change in a way that makes it more infectious for humans and the spillover into mammals is why there is more concern and vigilance. Um, but in terms of other viruses, well, of course, you go back to 2009, that virus had its origins, we believe, in pigs um, and, and spilled over into humans, although it was a pretty benign virus in the end. In terms of pandemic threat, it was it was pretty mild. But of course, we believe that the origin of pandemic viruses has animal reservoirs the precise pathway and mechanism could be multiple. Um, so any animal virus that starts establishing in other populations is one of concern. But we should stress that this virus doesn't seem to be able to enter livestock mammalian species. So for, even though it's been circulating for over 20 years, and, and Marty's group's done some very nice work in this space recently, this virus actually doesn't really want to be in those hosts. So the wildlife scavenging um, is, is a new dimension. I really want to support this, that we have really to talk mainly on a bird panzootic. So mm -hmm. the virus is improving in birds. And accidentally, we have this spillover. And looking at the number of infected birds, this is still not a lot. But it also means more birds, more spillovers and more mixture. So I think we need the awareness, but it's not the right time to say we are very close to a H5 pandemic. So it's a panzootic and we have to be careful. We have to look at it. And the zoonotic aspect is fortunately less than with the original one. So, and we can see this in some countries like Egypt, 
when the H5N1 went into Egypt, the number of human cases with H5N1 went down to zero. So, so one virus which was less zoonotic was uh, uh, better spreading in birds and then the cases went down. But we have to follow the situation and it's really difficult to predict what the virus is able to do. Yeah, from the immunity perspective, Martin, what uh, what where's, what is the barrier that um, keeps humans uh, infected from this virus? So the, the major hurdles are on one hand receptors, receptor optimization, optimization for replication. This is where we see the first adaptation in, in mammals like the 627K or this mutation in the minks. Uh, but there is further hurdles, antigenic uh, differences. Okay, we have no H5 antibodies, but there is also innate immunity. So our MXA is a very big hurdle for the virus. And there are some studies showing that it's not easy for H5 to overcome this. And this is probably one of the reasons why, for example, the minks are a species where it can overcome because there this innate immunity is not very strong. So not comparable to humans. And, and therefore, uh, uh, Ian mentioned it, the PIC. There, the MX is closer to the functions we have in humans. So if a virus is adapted to PICs, then we come closer to viruses which can easily jump to, to humans. So a H5 high pass virus adapted to PICs would uh, a very high concern, much higher than, than the minks. Could you quickly explain what MX is? That's a an, an protein which is directly fighting uh, the influenza virus uh, when it's replicating. It's an innate immunity uh, which is directed very much against uh, influenza viruses. And all pandemic viruses, they have normally a nuclear protein, so one protein which is able to escape this MX uh, gene. And the 1918 NP gene remained in all pandemics until the 2009. And then the swine flu virus developed a new nuclear protein. And this nuclear protein is not present up to now or this type in any of the H5 viruses. So this is also something we have to remember. There is a lot of hurdles for this viruses. And this is probably the reason that it's uh, up to now not going into really a pandemic situation uh, uh, the virus is spreading since 1996 in, in birds, so there's many, many years, but it's now better than ever, and we still have to follow it and be careful. Yeah, maybe a question that also um, is fitting quite well. The head of the WHO says we must prepare for a potential H5N1 human bird pandemic. If the science is uncertain about the potential for human spread, what is driving this remark? Yeah. It, well, yeah. any spillover event on the scale that we're seeing, it, in, as Martin says, it's a numbers game. It increases the risk, doesn't it? And and we know from from COVID that pandemic preparedness takes time to get vaccines, antivirals, therapeutics. Um, so we have things on the shelf. We don't have H5 vaccines ready to vaccinate people. We do have. Uh, WHO have what they call candidate vaccine viruses. So they survey all of these changes in the H5 viruses and they put down what they call a seed vaccine strain. So they can stop, they can start the process. So to make a vaccine is quite a long process, as we know. So they can do the preparative steps, but it would be foolhardy to make a vaccine um, to H5, because which strain of H5, which which one's going to give the best immunity in people? So which is the one that's going to jump? We don't actually know if one's going to jump and which one it is you want to make sure you've got the best vaccine. So you can do certain things in terms of the preparedness. I think the WHO was signaling it's really important that globally we work together, we do the tracking, we do the monitoring, we talked about the sea, sea lion case. It's really important that that information is gathered quickly and the data is shared with the international community to inform global pandemic preparedness. So I think that's really the signaling that we're seeing a change, a bit of a step change in the spread of this infection, and we shouldn't sit idle because obviously we know what happened with COVID. Hmm. There's also another question fitting uh, this quite well. Is there a good enough surveillance going on in terms of genomics and are there gaps or which gaps are the biggest? 
Maybe this also goes again uh, to you, Ian, since... <laughs> Oh, I'm sure Martin's just as qualified as I am, but I'll, I'll have a first go and I'm sure Martin could. Uh, look, we have come a long way from the emergence of H5 um, many years ago now. Um, when that virus first emerged, data was quite slow. Um, we didn't have the technology to generate genomes. We can generate genomes incredibly fast now, in hours. Uh, then it probably took days and weeks. Um, the ability to share data, there's an awful lot been done in the international space to generate uh, free and easy opportunities to share data. In fact, encouraging that we have repositories where we can re uh, deposit these genomes. Um, and so they're available to the scientific community. So the whole mind shift has changed. Um, we have to be respectful though, that those that invest money and time to do the surveillance, the scientists, the, the, the all the stakeholders, that they need to have value out of that work and that needs to be respected. But I think the genome sharing now in influenza is better than it's ever been. There's always room for improvement. And I think the challenge will be as we move forward, as this virus finds its way into new populations and new parts of the world that may not have been experienced in doing this work in the past, they may need assistance and encouragement and support to, to make sure that we get the, the genomic data. So. We talked about the sea lions, keep going back to them, but it's an interesting point. If there's the, you know, have the right samples been taken? Is there a, a system where there's the resources to able to generate this genomic data quickly and then you know, and then share that with, with the international community? And the feedback is, is that obviously the international community can provide advice and support to those countries in region that are suffering these problems. So, you know, the, it, it that that's possibly the gap is areas that are less used to doing this, but it's much better than it was, sure. I also think we, we, we have to, to improve that. It's always room for improvement, but I would say, especially if there is events where we think something is special, like the minks, the, the sea lions, or some die-offs, there we need uh, the, the sequencing as soon as possible and the sharing of the sequences and finally also sharing of strains. Hmm. How to characterize if you are not having it in hand and it takes some time. So this is, and we saw this also with the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic for characterization, strain sharing is also very important. Yeah. Ursula, uh, I got a bunch of questions that somehow come together and that I think fit your expertise. Um, how high is the mortality in birds? And um, can you also elaborate on bird species or populations that uh, you think are of especially um, are, are of special concern um, that are especially um, affected? So, uh, um, bird mortality, that's a huge question. <laughs> um, it depends very much on species. Um, there are species with very high mortalities, um, species that we knew that were highly susceptible, such as pelicans um, right now in South America. The brown pelican, brown pelican mortality is very high, um, but it's also a very abundant pelican species. But um, it's just sticking with pelican pelicans in the um, last spring, there was huge mortality in another pelican species that, in contrast to brown Pelicans was very, very um, endangered, which is the um, Dalmatian pelican, um, in which um, in Greece they lost one of the, the well, basically the most, the, the largest colony in the world of this species, and um, um, went down from uh, more than thousand birds to sixty. So um, uh, highest. So it depends very much on species. Um, uh, but uh, depending on species, the mortality can very, be very high, especially in colony breeding birds. Um, that's just something Ian and Martin have already talked about. Um, if the birds are close together, um, spread is um, far easier. Um, so this is where we generally get these um, high mortality events. And then on the, on the other hand, um, there are a lot of species with, in which mortality is probably much more sporadic, which for example, birds of prey, but on the other hand, among these are species with um, very reduced, very fragmented populations, um, such as um, thinking about the bearded vulture or, or um, peregrine falcons. Um, 
which which are highly endangered and for which um, just one of these stochastic events can be really really harmful. Um, so it's it's the question that's maybe Ian and and Martin can add some more to this, but um, it's difficult to answer just straightforwardly. Yeah. Um, we only have eight minutes left, so um, I would come would like to come to another point as well, um, the vaccinations and um, how do you assess the role of vaccinations for poetry? Um, I think this question goes again to Ian, right? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll have a first go again. Um, so vaccination has been used in poultry for quite some time now against lots of diseases, in fact, um, and some diseases have been successfully um, controlled. Uh, in poultry. So this is quite possible. We have now new technologies, new generation of vaccines, so we can do vaccination in a much more effective way. And some countries have been vaccinating for some time, but they've had variable success. Um, so normally where vaccination alone is used as the only frontline tool to defend against the virus, it will probably fail. I think it's recognised that it needs to be in combination with good surveillance, the ability to update the vaccines, um, the ability to monitor the efficacy of the vaccination program. And if you detect infected flocks, you have to take action to remove infection. So where vaccination is part of a control program, it can be highly successful. Um, and obviously with this global threat now, and with the, uh, you know, the benefits of advancement in vaccinology from COVID, there's a great opportunity here to, to develop um, more potent, efficacious vaccines, You've still got to be able to deliver those vaccines to large numbers of birds. That has to be practical. So, you know, how do you vaccinate uh, a house full of 100,000 chickens easily and ensure that all of those birds have received vaccines? So that's a challenge. How do you then track and make sure that the virus that's in the environment and the wild bird population doesn't still spill over into those flocks? Um, and, you know, as Martin touched on earlier, that the, these viruses are creative, they're evolving. So they could potentially in time escape vaccine immunity. So you need to have the potential to update the vaccine. So there's a lot of challenges to do vaccination well, but we have the tools and there is an awful lot of work going on around the world now, particularly in Europe, which will be really moving this forward so that vaccination is a real possibility. And ultimately, probably to reduce this very large fire that's burning in avian populations, vaccination is going to have an important role globally to try and suppress this problem. Um, yeah, Martin, did you want to add something? Uh, only a few additions uh, on, on, on one hand. For poultry, this is an option we have to think now. Also in the US, in Europe, where vaccination was not allowed before because we come into an endemic situation. So uh, if we have this now continuously, the pressure on the poultry farms is pretty high and uh, vaccination is one part in stopping this but we need the vaccine so hopefully they will be available and will be tested and licensed what it not will change a lot is the wild bird situation mm -hmm. so this will still uh, ongoing but even there is some discussion about vaccinating protected specially protected species etc but this will not be a a, a, a big thing. So I think we have then three different parts. This is the wild birds, which we cannot uh, change the situation very much. Uh, we have the poultry, where we have all the hygienic measures, and in the future, in, in more parts, maybe vaccination. And then we have the spillover inf infections, which we have to follow. Is there a risk that if you have infected poultry that they seem to be healthy, but then they can also infect wild birds again? Is there also a risk of vaccinations for wild birds? So this uh, then from th that poultry is infected, but you don't see it. That is always an argument uh, which is against vaccination. And therefore, what Ian mentioned, we need this monitoring and surveillance systems to be sure that no virus is spreading in the background of vaccination. We don't uh, uh, recognize it and the virus might changing, drifting away from the vaccine. But this is all things you can get under control by testing measures and, and things like that. And I think in, in Europe, it was not a major problem of the spillback from poultry to, to wild birds. But I think in Asia this is and Africa, this is a major issue. 
So there you have much more contact and not the same hygienic measures. And I think this was the beginning of the whole story that this ping pong system was allowed for many years. And uh, this could also not be stopped like in, in Egypt and other countries, Indonesia by vaccination, but you could reduce it. And you could also reduce human cases if you have a more zoonotic virus. Mm. There was another question um, that I would like to um, for, uh, yeah, forward to you. In terms of prevention and looking at cases of COVID out outbreaks too, would it be wise to close mink farms in general? Um, yeah, who wants to answer this question? Martin, go ahead. Please. I, I go ahead. So uh, I think we have to be careful in, in overall in having animals in large numbers under suboptimal conditions and this highly susceptible uh, animals. And there's, uh, there's areas in the world where we are talking about millions and millions of these animals. And there I would say this is a continuous risk and we should have a very close eye on it. And uh, if possible, this should be reduced as much as possible and should be controlled as much as possible. If you stop it totally, I think in Germany, it's, it's not possible also for welfare reasons. This comes in addition and I think this is good, but other countries still also in Europe uh, do it. And I hope that they, if they still have this kind of, of fur production, that it is under highly controlled uh, conditions uh, to avoid this kind of adaptations. Yeah. Do the other two would like to add something to that? No, I, I, I just second what Martin has said, that, it, you know, um, that, that it's banned in some countries in the UK. We, we, don't, we don't farm mink for the same reasons that Martin outlined. I think it's a recognition that there is a risk um, and not just for flu here. We're talking about any infectious disease has the ability to invade these host populations. And we know that, you know, it's not such a big jump to people from such populations. So is there important that they're well controlled and the hygiene's improved? Um, you know, so if, if they have to be raised, then they have to be raised under better hygiene and very good monitoring. So I know some rigorous systems were put in during COVID um, to routinely monitor. Monitoring in this sector probably wasn't something that happened before COVID. Then COVID told us that we need to check them very regularly. And if we do that and we apply the proper hygiene, then obviously we can reduce the risk. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, with looking at the time, I um, have to come to a close now. I know that we could not answer all the questions that were raised. I'm um, sorry for that. Um, however, uh, I would like to come uh, to my final question. Um, I will do a round, so I will ask this to each one of you. Uh, which aspect of the avian flu um, does concern you the most? Um, if you were the journalist, uh, which aspect would you address or stress in your reporting? Um, yeah, I would like uh, to start uh, with Ursula, please. Um, for me particularly, and, and I think it's, it's I've, I've stressed this several times, I think the wild bird component of this is really um, the key. It's a wild, well, it's a wild bird and poultry pen zootic really, but it's, um, it's uh, the, the change in epidemiology of this virus, the adaptation um, um, to wild birds and the impact it has on, on a lot of different wild bird populations and biodiversity is something really serious. And then as a second part is what, what Martin has stressed several times, um, this comes with increased uh, number of individuals and fit increased circulation, increased opportunity for the virus to adapt to a lot of different situations, um, also different species. And so the, the risk was really there um, where the, the opportunity the virus get, gets through this um, really widespread and wide circulation. And, and one of the things that Martin mentioned and Ian took up on um, earlier on, um, the other big, huge change we, we've um, seen in this virus and, and that makes it so interesting on one hand and dangerous, potentially dangerous on the other is um, that it, it also has changed completely in, in um, what we've been seeing earlier on that this was um, 
limited um, circulation and spread and outbreaks generally during winter. And now not only the virus has adapted more to wild birds and had get, has gathered force in, in, uh, in virulence and in spread between wild birds, but it's also able to persist longer. We have outbreaks in summer. So, and, and reasons, for example, as, as the Iberian Peninsula, where we've actually had very, very sporadic outbreaks, even in, in, in the earlier panzerotics and in other years, because we have a lot of UV light, we have a very high temperatures. And now we're seeing outbreaks in August in, in Spain, um, which is something really, really unprecedented. And this shows that this virus is changing in many ways that we don't have a handle on. And this is, this is why I would, would stress. Really. Thank you. Ian, what would you stress when you were a reporter? I, I touched on it earlier. I think the, the expansion of the virus's ability to infect other host populations, you know, wild birds. We, we talked on several occasions about the extent of wild birds. That takes the virus into places and niches and ecosystems that it's not been in before. That increases exposure to other populations. So that whole dynamic um, which is transforming quite fast on a global scale. And as that gets into those places, it's the concern I raised earlier about have we got good systems that are globally set up to track and monitor those concerning events fast. So that's the thing for me that, you know, if, if you are to avert risk and if this virus was to ever, heaven forbid, jump to humans, we need to have done that basic work in, in the animal and bird sector fast. So it is about global responsiveness here and working together globally um, to make sure that we can track this virus very fast and understand what it's doing. So I think that's my biggest concern is, have we got that global structure to ensure that we're communicating? Have we learned all the lessons from COVID? I suppose is the, is the question here. Yeah, Martin. What do you have to add? I would add, and this is a little bit summarizing what uh, was and Ian said, that I think it's the, the major point is still it's a global panzerotic in birds. And it's it's reaching now, and this is a point which is also worrying me most at the moment, that it's reaching areas where this type of virus has never been. And we are talking about a whole continent with a lot of different bird species which never had contact to this kind of virus, where we even don't know what kind of other influenza viruses are there, how the whole population, the, the, the biosystem will react there. And there is also a lot of poultry in some of these countries. So uh, I think this is a mixture uh, we have to follow up very closely. And then as a next step, uh, this spillovers. So to really be aware of this can, can happen to non-bird species. And finally, the genetic variability. So that this uh, virus is, is changing a lot even if it looks with the same name. So one H5 and one is not the same in, in uh, all regions. And this is something which means it's a highly dynamic situation, which we have closely to follow as Ian said and sequencing at the moment and surveillance monitoring is the measures we really need all over the globe. And this is a difference in some countries and we have to work on this to get this even better done to be informed early enough if something changes. Yes. Um, a big thank you to all three of you um, for being here today, for answering all the questions. I would like um, to say also thank you to all the attending journalists um, for all your questions that you put here. I know it's a huge topic and uh, we could probably continue this press briefing for another two hours. We would have had enough questions. Anyhow, we have to close it now. Uh, we will prepare a transcript uh, and provide this at our website as soon as possible. You will find a recording of this press briefing at the website of the German Science Media Center in about one to two hours. Um, and also uh, you can address us um, by email via redaktion at sciencemediacenter.de if you need a um, uh, uh, technical uh, transcript so the that is done by <laughs> by the program uh, without uh, further editing uh, you can immediately have it if you need it well thank you so much uh, for joining thank you for your time and uh, i wish you a nice weekend
Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, Ciao. Jan.